Hello and welcome to the first talk on multimodal learning analytics in this year's conf in this year's um, Black conference. Uh, today, I'm going to present you our work on predicting learners' effortful behavior and adaptive assessment using multimodal data. We are a team of um, researchers from uh, Norwegian uh, University of Science and Technology and Ecole Polytechnique de de Lausanne in Switzerland. Um, and we work in uh, teams that have kind of similar name, which has learner-computer interaction into it. So let's just start from um, what we are doing. So we want to predict learner's effortful behavior, as we said in the title of the paper. What do we mean by the effortful behavior? whether they are blindly guessing the answers to given questions or they are actually solving these questions to provide an answer. Um, why do we want to do this? The sole reason for why, why we want to do this is because we want to be able to uh, proactively help them. So if we see that um, some person is going to answer blindly um, guess in a guessing manner, we could uh, help them by giving them some some sort of help on the content and just not let them guess and our tools are basically these five we try to put um, these uh, multimodal sensors on students and get the data from them so that we can be able to help them in future um, to uh, answer our research question that how can we predict um, in advance, the effortful behavior of students, we did an experiment where we put a camera, an EG cap, um, an eye tracker, a wristband on the wrist to me measure the heart rate, the electrodermal activity, the skin temperature, and the blood volume pulse. And we had um, an adaptive test running that also records their activities like click streams and the reaction times. Um, for this experiment, we recruited 32 participants, out of which 15 were females. They, they participated in an online self-assessment test about front-end development that they were studying in the given semester. The overall test was for 45 minutes and uh, the adaptive test was created using um, IRT and MBT theories. Um, to see how we can predict, we followed a series of steps. And I will give you an overview now. So we collected the data, as I said uh, before. Then we removed noise from individual um, data sets uh, separately. Then uh, we extracted some of the features. We performed a k-means clustering. And then we trained some hidden Markov models. And then we used Viterbi the algorithms to predict the effort category, so effortful or effortless, that is effortful, that means you are going to actually solve the problem before giving an answer, and effortless, that means you are simply guessing the answer. Now we will go in details of each of these steps. So for data collection, as I said, we used um, an EEG cap, an NOBO 20 channel cap with 500 hertz of sampling rate. Um, for eye tracking, we used Toby 120 hertz um, monitor-based eye tracker that was fixed at the bottom of the monitor. For computing, uh, sorry, for capturing arousal, uh, we used um, an Empatica E4 that captures uh, four data streams, electrodermal activity, heart rate, temperature, and blood volume pulse at different um, uh, sampling rates. We put a Logitech camera that was zoomed into the faces um, at 150% uh, to get a 24 frame per second uh, face video of participants. And we zoomed it because we wanted to have less noise uh, in the face because of the background uh, movements and things like that. And we knew that people were not moving uh, that much. And for keystrokes, we used the interface uh, to record all the answers and all the um, reaction time related um, actions from participants. Once we have collected the data, each of these data sources had came with their own noise. So we had to go through uh, a proper noise reduction phase. So for example, eye tracking, our eyes move very fast and the raw data looks like um, just um, as if you have uh, dipped an ant into ink and left it on the white piece of paper. So we collected um, 
uh, raw data and from the raw data we computed fixations and saccades. So fixations are the points where your eyes stabilize for relatively short period of time, relatively uh, long period of time for um, uh, on a relatively smaller part of the screen and saccades are the uh, sudden jumps between um, two fixations. Um, from EEG first we removed the line filter because it's an electronic device. The uh, electric noise also plays a part in, in uh, the actual noise. So we first we removed the noise um, from uh, using a line filter of 50 hertz because we were in Europe, of course. Um, then we removed the um, noise from the jaw movements because it also affects the, the signals that we get. And finally, we removed the noise from the blinks because it affects the EEG signals a lot. From facial data, we just uh, detected the faces. We knew for most of the time that there will be only one face in the data collection phase. And um, our setup was so that, that the experimenter's face will appear in the beginning and at the end of the experiment. But we knew that it could only be from one side of the screen. So we just cut uh, the second face uh, in half of the data, in half of the recordings and the first phase in our other half of the recordings. So we made sure that we had only participants phase, uh, faces in, in the collected data. Uh, and from Empathica, we know that all these four data, set, data streams are susceptible for personal um, variances. For example, A, gender, whether the person was sleeping well a previous night, whether the person had smoked uh, before the experiment or uh, time of the day, his or her medical uh, condition. So first, we took the, the, the first uh, few seconds of the data and we um, and, and we divided the rest of the data for, from uh, using this first uh, 30 seconds of the data so that we can remove all the subjective bias from uh, these four data streams. And then we smooth um, the time series using uh, a Gaussian filter to remove some unwanted spikes. As you can see here in the figure, there are two unwanted spikes, two or three unwanted spikes per um, 10, 20 seconds. Once we have cleaned the data, everything was uh, synchronized with one computer's clock. So th there was no additional step needed for synchronizing all the, all the, all the data. And uh, then we started collecting um, uh, features from them. For example, we just uh, simply computed the mean fixation duration of uh, each question for each participant. And we called it attention as it is uh, commonly known uh, to, to signify. Now, from facial data, we computed emotional intensity. So we did not compute uh, given emotions. We computed the action units first, um, how the muscles on the face move, and we see if they contributed to a positive emotion or a negative emotion and averaged all these action units for them. And we said, okay, we don't care what kind of emotion you show, we need to see at what intensity you show these emotions. Then from EEG, uh, we divided them into further uh, bands based on the frequency using a fast Fourier transform. And uh, we computed the cognitive load, uh, load on memory and mental workload. All the uh, uh, measurements are computed using uh, previously known uh, formulas and the citations are given in the paper. And finally, we simply computed the mean uh, values of the four um, data streams coming from Empathica wristband uh, for each question for each participant. Then we use a k-means clustering algorithm to cluster based on these nine uh, measurements for each uh, question. And uh, we used the, the famous elbow method to find the, the perfect number of uh, clusters, which turns out to be five here. And we were minimizing the within cluster distance in this case. And on the right hand side, you can see that the number of members in each clusters are uh, more or less comparable. There is no one outstanding or no one cluster with very few members. Then we looked at how these clusters are different based on these nine variables. And we looked at um, 
simple ANOVAs and we see what is the highest effect size. And we went through the effect sizes and did the, the a pairwise ANOVA between two clusters. And here, for example, to see which cluster is defined by what kind of values, we need to see here, for example, we see that two turns out to be the largest, uh, to have the largest attention values among all five clusters. We, we can see that between one and two, two is the maximum, between two, three, two, four, and two, five, two is the maximum. And no one else is has higher attention values than uh, cluster two. We, dis, we did this exercise for all the um, clusters and all the variables, and we came up with the cluster definitions as follows. For example, cluster one has high mental workload, high load in memory, and high uh, and low uh, heart rate. Cluster two has high attention and high cognitive load. Cluster three has high electrodermal activity, high emotional intensity, high heart rate, low mental workload, and low load in memory. Cluster four has low emotional intensity, low cognitive load, and high blood volume pulse. And cluster five here has low attention and high heart rate. So these were the characteristics of these five clusters based on the multimodal data. Now, we know that how these clusters um, are appearing one after the other and how they can uh, point to one of the you know, effort categories, whether guessing or um, solving or effortless or effortful in other terms. So we use this data set to train a hidden Markov model. And here you can see that there are the self loops are predominant, um, but also the transition between uh, C2 and C4 is also very dominant among participants. And each of these clusters, they point to both um, effort categories with certain probabilities. Now, once we have created this hidden Markov model, what we did was we used with Herbie algorithm, which gives us uh, the most probable sequence of um, effort categories. We computed a sequence of 11 every time by training it with 10 previous um, quotients. And later, the 11th answer was our prediction and we matched it with the actual effort class on the 11th question and we iterated over this for all the participants and we came up with our confusion matrix and we can see that this gives us a fairly high uh, precision and recall uh, values now one can say why hmm why we terby so our answer to that question is that once you have trained an HMM, it encodes the transition between clusters and the information needed from the transition matrix to emission probabilities. That means it doesn't only takes the values of the multimodal measurements, but also how these values are changing to relate it to one of the effort categories. And this is why we thought that HMM would be a better um, way to predict the next class, uh, the next answer class. To prove this point, we said, okay, let's compare the Viterbi with two of the most common um, uh, prediction algorithms used in educational data mining and LAC. And we said, okay, let's take the multimodal features from last 10 questions feed them into support vector machine and a random forest separately, of course. And the, we predict the effort category for the 11th questions. We did a training, validation, and testing setup. And we said, okay, but here we are cheating on this case because the HMM has information of the previous effort category. So we said, okay, let's make two more classifiers with exactly the same uh, definitions, but this time we add the effect, effort category from last 10 questions as a feature as well. And then we compared the overall precision and recall for all these five methods. So 
SVM with polynomial kernel and random forest with pre either previous class information or no previous class information and our combination of HMM and Viterbi algorithm. And then we found that um, HMM and Viterbi gives the highest overall precision recall as compared to other methods. This goes on to some extent and proves our point that the way hidden Markov model codes the relationship between um, uh, current uh, transition between the physiological states and their relation between uh, their relation with the effort category is very important and there is more information coded than um, regular machine learning algorithms and coming back to our main motivation why we did all this so here we also present not only the prediction results not only the reason why we think how we think that HMM codes the information between uh, information about relationships between effort classes and observed measurements but also we can start thinking of what are the opportunities for proactive feedback when can we start telling people what they have done wrong and how can we help them for example here we see that we observe that a person is highly uh, loaded on memory and has is showing tendencies of high mental workload and he's also showing lower heart rate and we predict that he's going to guess a next question which is obvious my memory is overloaded my um, long-term memory is also overloaded my short-term memory is loaded what can i do i guess but then we can start giving some sort of cognitive feedback some sort of content related feedback on this but not only this we also give positive reinforcement to students for example if we see that the the emotional intensity is high the electrodermal activity is high but the load and memory and mental workload is low and we predicted that he is going to actually solve the problem in this case we can provide some sort of uh, support to the person uh, some sort of positive reinforcement to the student and we also have the fourth case here where our algorithm was not so confident so we need of course some improvements in the future and that's my talk Thank you very much for listening to me and you can send your question to the email given here and I will, I, I promise I will take time to answer all your questions. Thank you.